Hi, and welcome to the lecture on the medical overview. After completion of this chapter and all related coursework, you will understand the need for proper assessment techniques when called to patients who have a chief complaint of a medical nature. The National EMS Education Standard Competencies state that an EMT will be able to apply fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transport based on assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. For medical overview, we're going to talk about the assessment and management of a medical complaint and the pathophysiology assessment and management of medical complaints to include transport and destination decisions. When talking about infectious diseases, you want to be aware of a patient who may have an infectious disease, as well as the assessment and management of a patient who may have an infectious disease. Patients who need EMS assistance generally have experienced either a medical emergency, a trauma emergency, or both. Trauma emergencies involve injuries resulting from physical forces that are applied to the body and medical emergencies involve illnesses or conditions caused by disease. It is important for the EMT to remember that patients may have a combination of medical and trauma conditions affecting their health. Types of medical emergencies. The types of medical emergencies that we're going to discuss include respiratory emergencies, and these occur when patients having, are having trouble breathing or when the amount of oxygen supplied to the tissues is inadequate. Diseases that can lead to respiratory emergencies include asthma, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis. Cardiovascular system emergencies are caused by conditions affecting the circulatory system. Some common examples include heart attacks as well and congestive heart failure. Neurologic emergencies involve the brain. These may be caused by a seizure, a stroke, or fainting or syncope. The most well-known GI condition is appendicitis. There are many others, including diverticulitis and pancreatitis. A urologic emergency can involve kidney stones. The most common endocrine emergencies are caused by complications of diabetes mellitus. Hematologic or blood emergencies may be the result of sickle cell disease or various types of blood clotting disorders such as hemophilia. Immunologic emergencies involve the body's response to foreign substances, and allergic reactions are a type of immunologic medical emergency that can range from fairly minor to life-threatening. Toxicology um, emergencies include poisoning and substance abuse result in other types of medical emergencies. Behavioral emergencies may be especially difficult to deal with because patients often do not present with typical signs and symptoms. Gynecologic conditions are a special category of medical emergencies that involve the female reproductive organs. We'll start with patient assessment. Assessment of the medical patient is similar to assessment of a trauma patient, but there is a different focus. You want to focus on the nature of illness, the patient's symptoms, and their chief complaint. With a medical incident, it is very important to establish an accurate medical history. You use dispatch information to guide your initial response, but do not get locked into a preconceived idea of what's going on with your patient. Injuries may distract from the underlying condition and tunnel vision occurs when you become focused on one aspect of the patient's condition and exclude all others, which may cause you to miss an important illness or injury. Assessment may be difficult with uncooperative or hostile patients. You need to maintain a professional, calm, non-judgmental demeanor at all times and refrain from labeling patients and displaying a personal bias. A frequent caller may have a difficult complaint at this time. The steps of patient assessment, major components are scene size up, primary assessment, history taking, secondary assessment, and reassessment. For scene safety, ensure the scene is safe for you, your partner, your patient, and bystanders. You also need to determine the necessary standard precautions you need to take and whether you need additional resources. Mechanism of injury or nature of the illness. For medical patients, it's always the nature of the illness, but do not forget that trauma may play a part. The index of suspicion is your awareness and concern for potentially serious underlying and unseen injuries or illness. Primary assessment. You form your general impression. You perform a rapid scan. Your visual clues should include apparent unconsciousness, obvious severe bleeding, extreme difficulty breathing. You need to determine the patient's level of consciousness using the AVPU scale. Regarding airway and breathing, in a conscious patient, you need to ensure the airway is open and that they are breathing adequately. Check their respiratory rate, depth, and quality. When in doubt, apply oxygen. If a patient is unconscious, make sure you open their airway using the proper technique for their condition and take several seconds to evaluate their breathing. 
As you evaluate circulation in your primary assessment, you need to assess the circulation in a conscious patient by checking the radial pulse and observing skin color, temperature, and condition. If your patient is unconscious, assess the circulation at the carotid artery. Make your transport decision. The following patients should be considered in a serious condition and in need of rapid transport. Patients who are unconscious or who, ha or who have altered menstruation, patients with airway or breathing problems, patients with obvious circulatory problems such as severe bleeding or signs of shock. If the patient does not meet the criteria for rapid transport, continue your assessment on scene and prepare for transport when you have completed the assessment and treatment. History taking. Always investigate the chief complaint. You gather a thorough history from the patient and any family, friends, or bystanders who may be near. You investigate the nature of the illness by asking questions regarding the chief complaint. For an unconscious patient, you need to survey the scene looking for things like medication containers or medical devices. As you continue your information gathering process, remember to get your sample history and to ask questions about the chief complaint and we use the OPQRST mnemonic for this. O for onset of the problem. P for provocation or palliation, what makes it better or worse, Q for quality, R for region or radiation, S for severity on a scale of 1 to 10, and T for timing. You should record any allergies, medical conditions, or medications the patient may be taking. Your secondary assessment. The secondary assessment may occur on scene or en route to the emergency department. In some cases, you may not have time to conduct a secondary assessment if your patient is critical. Physical exam. All conscious patients should undergo a limited or focused assessment based on the chief complaint. For an unconscious patient, you should always perform a full body scan or head to toe exam to obtain clues or assess the problem. Examine the head, scalp, and face. Examine the neck closely. Assess the chest and abdomen, palpate the arms and the legs, and examine the back. Treatment depends on what you find and on your local protocols. Obtain vital signs. Assess the pulse for quality, rate, and rhythm at the most appropriate site. Identify the rate, quality, and regularity of respiratory effort and any difficulties that may be apparent. Obtain your initial blood pressure measuring both systolic and diastolic numbers. Use monitoring devices. Consider using the automated blood pressure cuff for future assessments at regular intervals and consider obtaining a blood glucose level and a pulse oximetry reading. Reassessment. Once the assessment and treatment have been completed, reassessment should begin and continue throughout transport. Repeat the primary assessment and reassess your chief complaint. Consider the need for ALS rendezvous and repeat your physical exam to identify and treat changes to the patient's condition. Interventions. Review all your treatments that you have performed and then document any changes that developed as a result of the treatments and if needed adjust any of these treatments accordingly. Management, transport, and destination. Most medical emergencies require a level of treatment beyond that available in the pre-hospital setting. May require advanced testing available in a hospital it may be beyond your scope as an EMT to administer medications to the patient. Any administration of medication by an EMT requires direct, position, direct permission from medical control or standing orders. EMTs can use an automated external defibrillator on a patient who is pulseless and apneic. Same time. We have to realize that same time may be longer for medical patients than for trauma patients, but realistically we should always try to stick to a limited same time because transport is an important part of the treatment process. Gather as much information as possible to transmit to the emergency department. Critical patients always need rapid transport. These critical patients include any patient with an altered mental status, patients with airway or breathing difficulties, patients with any sign of circulatory compromise, patients who are very old or very young. Types of transport. In a life threatening, if a life threatening condition does exist, the transportation should include lights and sirens. If the patient is not critical, careful consideration should be given to non emergency transport. Modes of transport ultimately come in one of two categories ground or air. Ground transport EMS units are generally staffed by EMTs and paramedics. 
Air transport EMS units are generally staffed by critical care nurses and paramedics. Destination selection. Generally, the closest hospital should always be your destination. However, there are times a patient will benefit from going to another hospital that is capable of handling their specific condition. Some types of reasons we would do this would be a trauma center, a burn center, a stroke center, a cardiac cath lab, any of these things. Infectious diseases. The general assessment principles that we need to think about here, we have to approach our patient with an infectious disease just like we would any other medical patient. We do a scene size up and take standard precautions. Perform your primary assessment and history taking. Typical chief complaints include fever, nausea, rash, pleuritic chest pain, and difficulty breathing. General management principles focus on any life-threatening conditions identified in the primary assessment. You should be empathetic. Place the patient in the position of comfort on the stretcher and keep them warm. And follow your standard precautions. Always follow your agency's exposure control plan and cleaning equipment and properly discard any disposable supplies as well as linens. You should focus, as I said, any life-threatening conditions identified here. Just follow these general management principles. Some common or serious communicable diseases we need to be aware of. Herpes simplex. This is a common virus strain carried by humans. Of individuals carrying the virus, 80% do not have symptoms. Symptomatic infections can be serious and are on the rise. The primary mode of infection is through close personal contact, so standard precautions are generally sufficient to prevent spread to or from healthcare workers. HIV. No vaccine yet exists to protect against HIV or AIDS. Despite treatment progress, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome is still fatal. It is not easily transmitted in the EMS work setting, and it is far less contagious than hepatitis B. The EMT's risk of infection is limited to exposure to an infected patient's blood or body fluids. Many patients with HIV show no symptoms. You should always wear the proper type of gloves and take great care in handling and disposing of needles and scalpels. Cover any open wounds that you have whenever you are on the job, and if you have any reason to think that a patient's blood or secretions may have entered your system, seek medical advice as soon as possible. Syphilis. Although syphilis is commonly thought of as an STD, it is also bloodborne. There is a small risk for transmission through needle sticks and direct blood-blood contact. If treated with penicillin, the individual is considered non-communicable within 24 to 48 hours, and the initial infection with syphilis produces a lesion called a canker. Hepatitis. Hepatitis is inflammation and often infection of the liver. Early signs include loss of appetite, vomiting, fever, fatigue, a sore throat, and jaundice, as well as right upper quadrant abdominal pain. You see in this chart, table 12-2, the characteristics of hepatitis and that there are actually, this chart says four kinds. Um, there really is five. There's a hepatitis E that is also foodborne, uh, like hepatitis A. Um, and then toxin-induced hepatitis, um, like medications, drugs, and alcohol, which cause problems with the liver, are also shown here. And you should familiarize yourself with the characteristics of hepatitis contained in this chart. Toxin-induced hepatitis is not contagious. There is no sure way to tell which hepatitis patients are contagious, and a carrier is a person or animal in whom an infectious organism has taken up permanent residence and may or may not cause an active disease. Hepatitis A is transmitted orally through oral fecal contamination. Hepatitis B is far more contagious than HIV, and there is a vaccination with hepatitis B vaccine highly recommended for EMTs. Meningitis. Meningitis is an inflammation of the meningeal coverings of the brain and spinal cord. Signs and symptoms include fever, headache, stiff neck, and altered mental status. Most forms of meningitis are not contagious. However, one form, meningococcal meningitis, is highly contagious. You should take standard precautions. Gloves and a mask will go a long way to prevent the patient's secretions from getting into your nose and mouth. Vaccines are rarely used and meningitis can be treated at the emergency department with antibiotics. After you treat a patient with meningitis, you should contact your employer health representative, and in many states, communicable diseases like meningitis are considered reportable. Tuberculosis. 
TB is a chronic mycobacterial disease that usually strikes the lungs. Many infected patients are well most of the time, and if the disease involves the brain or kidneys, the patient is only slightly contagious. Disease that occurs shortly after infection is called primary TB. Reactive TB is common and can be much more difficult to treat, especially because an increasing number of tuberculosis strains have grown to resist most antibiotics. Patients who pose the highest risk almost always have a cough. And you should consider respiratory tuberculosis to be the only contagious form because it is the only one that is spread airborne. Absolute protection from infection with the tubercular bacillus does not exist. Everyone who breathes is at risk. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, one-third of the world's population is infected with TB. The vaccine is rarely used in the United States, and the mechanism of transmission is not very efficient. You should have TB skin tests regularly, and if the infection is found before you become ill, preventative therapy is almost 100% effective. Pertussis, or whooping cough. It is an airborne disease caused by bacteria that mostly affects children younger than six. Symptoms include fever and a whoop sound that occurs when inhaling after a coughing attack. Prevent exposure by placing a mask on yourself and the patient. And this disease has made a comeback uh, because of the fact that patients for years after they got to be in high school did not get the pertussis part of the uh, Tdap vaccine. They just got the DT. And so now they've gone back to giving everybody Tdap. MRSA, or Methicillin-Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's a bacterium that causes infection. It is resistant to most antibiotics. In healthcare settings, it is transmitted from patient to patient by unwashed hands of healthcare providers. Studies have shown 5 to 15% of healthcare providers carry MRSA in their noses. Factors that increase the risk for developing MRSA include antibiotic therapy, prolonged hospital stays, a stay in an ICU or a burn unit, exposure to infected patients. The incubation period appears to be between 5 and 45 days. This is a very long incubation period. New and emerging diseases. Hantavirus. Hantavirus is rare but deadly and it's transmitted through rodent urine and droppings. It is not transmitted from person to person directly but via food or a vector such as rodents. West Nile virus. The vector is the mosquito. It affects humans and birds and these diseases are not communicable and pose no risk during patient care. SARS or severe acute respiratory syndrome. SARS is a serious, potentially life-threatening viral infection caused by a recently discovered family of viruses. It usually starts with flu-like symptoms, which may progress to pneumonia, respiratory failure, and in some cases, death. It is transmitted by close person-to-person -person contact or by secretions. Avian flu. Avian bird flu is caused by a virus that occurs naturally in the bird population. This virus is carried in the intestinal tract of wild birds and does not usually cause illness. However, in domestic bird populations like chickens, ducks, and turkeys, it is very contagious. If an infected bird is used for food and is cooked, it does not pose a risk to those who eat it. Humans can get it when they have close contact with infected birds, but no rapid human-to-human -human cases have been reported. H1N1 or swine flu. It has been present for years in animals and it is contagious in humans and it is only one of many forms of influenza. In summary, trauma emergencies are emergencies that are the result of physical forces applied to the body and medical emergencies require EMS attention because of illnesses or conditions not caused by an outside force. The assessment of a medical patient is similar to the assessment of a trauma patient, but the focus is more on symptoms and medical history than on visible physical injuries. Many medical patients may not appear to be seriously ill at first glance. And for conscious medical patients, obtaining a thorough patient history can be one of the most beneficial aspects of the patient assessment. Conscious medical patients seldom need a full body scan, but all should get a focused exam based on their chief complaint. On the other hand, always perform a full body scan on unconscious patients. Most medical emergencies require a level of treatment beyond what is available in the pre-hospital setting. 
Also, the treatments depend on an accurate diagnosis of the exact medical condition. Therefore, advanced testing in the hospital may be required. If the patient is not in critical condition, you should gather as much information as possible from the scene so that you can transmit that information to the physician at the emergency department. Many medical emergency patients do not have immediate life-threatening conditions. If a life-threatening condition exists, transportation should include the use of lights and sirens, but if that is not the case, careful consideration should be given to non-emergency transport. Modes of transport ultimately come in one of two forms, ground or air. Many medical patients will benefit from being transported to a specific hospital capable of handling their particular condition. Because it is often impossible to tell which patients have infectious diseases, you should avoid direct contact with blood and body fluids of all patients. If you think you may have been exposed to an infectious disease, see your physician or your employer's designated physician immediately. Six infectious diseases are of special concern. These are HIV, hepatitis B, meningitis, tuberculosis, SARS, and H1N1. Infection control should be an important part of your daily routine. Be sure to follow the proper steps when dealing with potential exposure situations. Thank you for your attention, and as I said, if you have questions, please bring them to class to discuss with your instructor.